There you go. Well, you got to mute yourself, yes. Okay, guys, today we're uh, going to diverge a little bit from the last two courses, last two lectures we were talking about specifically about MPI and parallel um, distributed memory systems. Today we're going to still talk a little bit about MPI, but we're going to broaden the scope specifically to talk about parallel I.O. Um, I.O. is kind of like the you know, red-headed stepchild. Everybody kind of does it, but they, they just forget about it in terms of there's not a lot of, you don't want to focus much on it, you need to do it, but you don't spend a lot of attention because usually you just write your file and good enough. Um, however, in parallel, that becomes, uh, like a lot of things, even more of a, a bottleneck sometimes. Because as we talked about in communication and overhead, anytime you, talk, you do communication, um, and commonly that communication I.O. considers part of that, you're not actually doing any real work. And if you're doing, now that you're using a lot more processors, you can actually generate or ingest a lot more data. So the way you interact with that data in and out becomes more important. So today we're going to talk about um, a couple of different techniques to deal with disk I.O. So disk I.O. is commonly used for checkpoint restart files. If you're running a big simulation, you know, you, you don't want, if you've been running for three days, you should be, uh, have built in some ability to be able to restart your code. That's commonly called restart or checkpoint files. Uh, if you're doing data analysis, the whole data is stored in the files. Uh, as much as you might not like it, that's your medium to track through. Um, how you organize your input output, that's what, that's what you're dealing through. Um, and then also there's, there's many other reasons that you're going to have disk, uh, disk I.O. activity. Um, one of them is to install Apple software updates. Um, so the problem is the fundamental is, is, is I.O. is basically bad. Just like communications are slow, but I.O. I, I is, is fundamentally just has not grown at the rate that comp the other uh, memory and CPU power has. We're still using mechanical disks with spinning platters store magnetic media um, for, for information. Um, newer systems have SSDs, and they're better. They're good for transactions. But still, dollars per terabyte, it's still, for the next foreseeable future, still mechanical operations. And so there's a lot of overhead with system call, open, closing, reading, writing. Um, the file systems are, are OK. There are parallel file systems now that can help with that. Um, we use one called GPFS at Synet. However, they're still kind of kludges. They were basically serial systems that they've been work a little bit better, but they still have issues. Um, high performance computing systems are really designed for high bandwidth, not high IOPS. Uh, bandwidth is pretty straightforward. That's just how many eggs a minute you're writing. So if you're writing lots of big chunky data, that's not too bad. But if you're doing a lot of the system call overheads, a lot of opens, closes, those are called IOPS or operations per second. And if you do a lot of those, that will grind the system to really to a fault, actually add a lot of overhead. So you want to avoid a lot of that type of stuff. So just like when you write your MPI calls, instead of doing an array of 1,000 and running 1,000 messages, um, same with the I.O., you, instead of writing 1,000 1K files, it's better to read one 1 meg file. And, and it'll be a much more, because you only need one open and then that one big data read. So, um, so this is just a plot I like to throw up, just data rate of access over time. You know, this is kind of like the Moore's Law type of thing. But as you can see, the red, it's, it grew. We've gotten better. but the performance of the supercomputers on the green is growing at a much better rate, and that's still going on. Um, even if you put, even if you replace these mechanical drives with um, SSDs, um, they actually flatten out in a different way because capacity is not quite there. There is some newer technology with NVMe and stuff, but it's still outstripping. Uh, the performance is basically becoming free compared to the data movement. That's even true for memory as well as uh, mechanical disk. So this is a, a plot in terms of time or how much time you're waiting. You know. Tape is really, really slow. Magnetic tape, we still use it for long-term storage because it's cheap. Because once you, uh, cheap in the sense it doesn't use any power, once you copy it, it sits on a shelf. It's not using anything. But it's really, really slow to access. Um, disk is better. Flash is even better. You know, and CPU operations are down the bottom. But this tells you how much time you're waiting. If you have to actually wait for a piece of data off of the disk, right? I mean, it's six orders of magnitude longer than if you just had it locally in the cache. So. What that all that really tries to tell you is just you want to be as close to the bottom as possible. So anytime you have to use disk, but you want to use it sparingly. Um, same with like memory. You, you don't have to move data around. You don't want to. And that gap is only getting bigger. 
So IOPS, I mentioned this, just input output operations per second. That's read, writes, open, closes, seeks. That's all your F opens and that type of stuff. Just That's like your communications type stuff. Just communication with the disk system as opposed to another node. Um, it's just, this is the type of stuff you want to minimize. A uh, bandwidth, this is just same as network bandwidth. This is the size of your message. So if you're going to write it, write a big chunk. Um, you, you don't have a choice in a lot of cases, but you just want to uh, uh, minimize how many IOPS and maximize your bandwidth um, to try to get good throughput. That'll help your performance. This is just some comparisons for hard drives. So a SAT is a typical hard, hard drive. You get 100 megs a second on a node. You can do about 100 IOPS. Uh, a solid state drive, the bandwidth is not a little bit better, but, but the biggest thing is the IOPS because you're not waiting for a, 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 a drive head to move around in a physical space. It can actually just, like a pointer, go and get access to that. The IOPS is much better. Um, the thing like Synet, we've got pretty good bandwidth. Well, it's, it's actually not very good bandwidth for the size of the system. But if you actually divide it out, you can look down per node here, and you can see we're actually much worse when it comes to um, the bandwidth and the IOPS per node than you would on your local desktop. So you can imagine you had an application you've run on your desktop. It works OK, you know, my bandwidth issues, no, net, no IO problems. Then you scale it up and try to run 100 of them on Synet. And we're like, whoa, your performance is bad and everything else is because the, the big HPC systems are traditionally um, starved a bit on IO because they were traditionally were flops intensive. And you try to minimize the, 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 the overall uh, uh, file system. That's changing a bit with you know big data type systems and things like this. However, you're still very, very heavy on the flops as opposed to you are on the disk stuff. So as I said, just like communications, you want to you, know, you need to do IO, but you want to be able to do you know, minimize the effect of it so that you're not actually spent wasting a lot of time waiting and actually you know pissing off everybody else in the system too. Because unlike your if your code is slow in a general sense, it hurts you, but if you're hammering the file system, anybody's used a big shared file system, everybody feels it. <laughs> because you could easily chew up all those IOPS of everybody else's. So that's one thing just for you know playing what playing nice, you definitely want to uh, have that um, under control. So I'm not going to get too much into this, but there's a general IO software stack where you're you're working at the application layer. That's your code. Um, there's of course between you right down to the IO hardware being the actual physical hardware. There's a lot of software in between that. And most of it's hidden between you and the OS. If you're using a library, like uh, we'll talk about this, like NetCDF or HDF5, um, that maps to a series of calls. If like you're going to be, we're going to talk about MPIO, which is IO through MPI that sits in the middle. And then there's actually a file system. So that's a GPFS, a Luster, you, NFS, uh, you know, Windows, FAT, you know, NTFS, pick your file system. Those are all the layers. And I just put this out here because You'll hear a lot of these terminologies talked about, and you're, app you're accessing it in different layers. And it, it's just like programming. You know, either, either you're making a library call or a system call or lower down. Uh, the I.O. system maps much the similar way. And depending on how low level you want to get, um, like i.e., you, know, you do an offset for how many bytes of the size of a double is, um, you may have to do that in the middleware, but not on a high level like you do like a NCDF. So um, some just general I.O. type stuff, do binary. <laughs> um, it's just natively binary copies, just takes it out of memory, dumps it onto the disk. When you dump it into ASCII, um, fine for small case files for testing. It's great. It's readable. Problem is, is it has to convert it. There's a lot more overhead to convert that into the cars to actually write it to the file. It's very wasteful in performance and also in disk space. The ASCII's got a lot of empty space in it. Binary literally is just it takes it out of memory, dumps it on the disk. Um, if you're writing parallel I.O. codes, especially writing a big MPI code, look at some sort of parallel I.O. strategy. We're going to talk about those later, but there are different ways. You should try to um, in incorporate that from the beginning. It'll make your life easier. Uh, don't you know, write lots of ASCII files, especially lots of ASCII files. We've got people coming with codes at Synet. We've had, you know, they're writing, scaling up the problem, and every ACTs and Gs or whatever written in separate files, and they have 275 million files in their directory or something crazy like this. It's just it won't work. You're just you're just hurting yourself. So come up with if you are need, need to do a large data problem, then integrate that into your just as important as selecting your time stepping method or picking your algorithm for parallel scalability. This is very much something you should look at, and it doesn't have to be very uh, complicated either. 
Uh, data management, so there's different formats. We talked about ASCII, that's just your standard text files, binary. Um, there's more, that, that's just native files. And also you can store metadata, which is, you know, store information about your files. How many people here, when they output their code, it's fine. They, re they have the output named Thursday, September 22nd, run 146. Well, you're storing metadata in the file name. Well, you can actually do that properly in the actual file itself, a self-describing file. That way you actually have um, a sort of a record inside itself. If you have a lot of very complicated data you want to search, you can actually look at databases and stuff like that. I'm not going to cover that here, but if it is something where you just, you know, you have more than a couple of parameters you might want to search, and maybe, or there's lots of little data, using a database might be a better way than just using a traditional file. Uh, and then the standard libraries you can use, um, which what we like to promote um, instead of writing your own, we're going to talk about HDF5 and NetCDF. These are common, um, you know, library applications. You don't have to actually get into writing the format, but they're portable. Somebody's written a standard. There's a library to them, and it makes it a little easier for you to, uh, first of all, write your code because you're using a standard API, and also tools. A lot of visualization tools will read these files already, right? So instead of making your specific one. And if you're using a visualization program like Paraview or something, you're the much easier to hook into these standard formats. Um, so this is just an example of ASCII versus binary. So as you can see, it doesn't matter. Either it's a scratch sitting in RAM disk, the ASCII is way, way slower um, just for writing a bunch of data. So and the, the, the syntax between one and the other is pretty straightforward. All you're doing is switching from fprintf to fwrite or to a, to a, to a read, you know, same for a thing. So it's just, just, it's just something to think about. If you're starting to scale up to, you know, multiple, even multiple megs, you really should have some, you know, keep both options, right? Write your I.O., your code in a modular way so that you have an you know, I.O. function. You can turn on, on ASCII or turn on one. So if you're debugging, leave the ASCII on. When you're running your real code, you have the binary. So this is just an example of metadata. So you can actually use like an XML type stuff in your file. Some of the file formats, we're going to talk about HDF5, and some of these do this intrinsically in themselves. Most people are used to web type stuff. This is very popular now, just using some sort of XML format where you can, you can, you can embed, and there's libraries, MXML, and these other ones where you can include that as well. So you can include a lot of information about what you're actually trying to run, especially if you're doing large amounts of stuff. Say you've got a, some, um, you know, some satellite data, and you've got all these images. Well, you can actually put in the time, the position, you know, all the details actually embedded right inside of raw formats, even the date, the, the version of the software that was written, all that stuff, embedded right in the code. And you don't have to have to worry about, um, you know, remembering where that came from or what directory structure it was. So it's just a little bit of upfront thought will actually help you with a lot of the pre and post processing um, of this data. So let's say I should get into the parallel IO um, stuff. Most of that stuff was just generic IO bookkeeping. It's important, but what we're really going to want to talk about today is, okay, I'm writing a parallel code, so all my I.O. is traditionally serial. Um, what, how are ways that I can go about this? So um, I, can use, I can still keep my sequential I.O. What it means, though, is, is that from the bottom there, you can see I have my four processors. They all do some stuff, but I'm only going to let processor zero do the, the writing and the reading. And that's fine. You can do that. But I mean, you can see right away where the issue is. You know, for a few files, that's fine. And if it's a small amount of data, you're only outing, running out a couple of integers, fine. But there's a huge bottleneck design problem as this scales out because everything's got to send. I've got all the overhead of sending all the information back to processor zero. And then I'm waiting, doing nothing while he's doing all his writing and reading. So, you know, um, you can do that, but it's not a good idea. Now, a common way, and this is the way we've, you're usually the first people come across, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with this, is um, we'll just say that everybody writes their own file, right? Simple to do, no contentious issues, no communication overhead, at least from a program point of view. Um, so what's wrong with this? Well, for the first blush, it's, it's nothing for a small scale. Where it really comes into the problem is, is as you get to a really large scale. If I start having a thousand processors running a thousand files and I'm doing a timestamp for a time series, and I want to do a thousand of those, <laughs> that means my run is a million files. And that's hard on the file system. 
as I said, for a lot of performance reasons. If in the same directory, you get file locks. So that has to do with um, accessing multiple files at the same time. So that can cause problems. And it just becomes unwieldy. I have a million files. Just even doing an ls in that directory is almost impossible. Right? It, now I've got to actually do some sort of post-processing where I take those 1,000 files per time step, crunch them together, and do this type of stuff. So instead of doing that in the post-processing step, um, shouldn't there be a way to be able to do this in parallel to synchronize this and write one file for multiple processors? And ideally, that's what parallel I.O. is talking about. It's basically doing this, but instead of them being four blocks together on the bottom, we're all going to write to the same file. But we have to do this in a way that has a little bit of communication to make sure that we're not all writing to the same piece of the same file. So it's a little bit of extra communication. Instead of writing to four separate files, we all write to one file, but we make sure we only write in the piece that we need to. That way, we kind of integrate that pre- and post-processing step right into our simulation, and we're good. So it's just it's as simple as it sounds. Uh, multiple processes accessing one file. So you have to do a little bit of extra bookkeeping, because you can't just go F open and let the operating system say where you want to write. Because if you access one spot and you access one spot, I got to make sure you don't step on each other's toes. So that's, that's effectively what most of Parallel I.O., just like MPI communications, is just making sure everybody talks to the right spot. Um, yeah, so non-Parallel I.O. is simple, but it's poor performance. Uh, and awkward and large scalable. Parallel I.O. is better, beneficial. Uh, you get single files, uh, and it works with the file system. There's hooks in the low level. We talked about all the middleware stacks. If you're using GPFS, if you're using a library or MPIO, um, they're aware of that. And so if they know these two processes are both writing to the same part, they'll try to optimize it instead of just holding back and just ingesting all the data and having to juggle at all the separate times. You will end up getting a, a better performance. People used to not like Parallel I.O. because on systems like NFS and stuff, they didn't handle it very well. But on modern HPC systems with a parallel file system, this is the intrinsic way it should work. So uh, using this is, is, not, is, is actually helping you. Now, the good thing is, is that um, there are different ways to do this. As I talk about, we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about MPIO, because we've talked about MPI. And in the, in the MPI2, there was a standard to specifically handle this problem. It's a little low level, though. And you'll see from some of the examples that I talk about, you have to do, just like a lot of MPI, you got to figure out all your offsets, and there's a lot of bookkeeping. An easier way to do, and especially if you have a, a straightforward data format, is to use one of the more common libraries. Um, NetCDF or uh, HDF5 are, are very common ones. And these are uh, very easy APIs. Somebody's written the low level shifts and all that type of details for you. And you just call, create a file in a special way, give it the size of the arrays you want, it'll dump the file. And these are standard formats. And you don't have to write, reinvent the wheel. Now, if you want to do your own MPI, oh, go right ahead. It's just that sort of, you're going to have to do a little more bookkeeping yourself. So the good thing is, if you use HDF5 or NetCDF, it can work fine in serial. But then the calls, most of the time, there's only some minor changes that have to be made to use them in parallel. Whereas uh, when you're going to do MPIO, it's MPIO. You're writing an MPI-like interface for that type of stuff. Um, there's some newer ones like Adios and stuff too that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but there are some newer languages coming, or newer inter interfaces as well. So what I'm first going to talk about is I'm going to talk about MPIO. Uh, then I'll go some some NetCDF examples. Uh, MPIO is, is the IO library. Uh, came out in the... the um, built on MPI. It's built right into the standard. Um, it's probably one of the only features that a lot of people use out of the MPI 2. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, and it's actually what a lot of the libraries are built upon. So this is in that sort of middle middleware of the application layer, uh, below the application layer. And then NetCDF and HDF5 are written on top of this. So they're actually using the MPIO to do the work, which is great. It means you, it just depends on where on that stack you want to fit. Right? It's kind of like you using an application, a library like Scalapack, you make a parallel call. Well, it's using MPI in the back end. You may not be accessing it directly. You're doing it through a library. This is the same idea. So it's good, even if you're not going to be writing MPIO, to kind of understand the main features of what is going on. So then when you do use a library, you can kind of see why certain decisions were, were made, because it'll make more sense um, you know, why they might be doing things a certain way. 
Um, yeah, so that's why many other parallel solutions use this as a backend. And they do this because it's portable. It's just the reason people write MPI code. Um, if you write an MPI code, you would compile it for that library. You can bring it anywhere. You can do it on your desktop. You can do it on HP system. It's not really tied in specifically like that. Um, and it, and it, uh, MPIO has this whole idea of collective operations, which fundamentally that's what IO is going to be. You're, you're, you know, you're doing across multiple systems. You're probably not just writing from one or two processes. You're writing from multiple ones. So anytime you can coordinate and collect that all together, uh, you can actually make a fairly efficient uh, routine. So uh, advantages. It's non-contiguous access to files and memory. What it means is I don't have to, I'll just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8. I can go 1, 10, 20, 30, and have staggers and just point to different parts of the file system. As long as I control it, I can write blocks in any pattern I want. So this allows me to actually write. Um, so if I have a, a series of processors and I want to write all the doubles every third, inner, every third space, I don't have to do it all in a contiguous chunk of memory. I can, I can skip spaces and then fill it in with another processor. What this means is, is that if I have a complicated data structure or say I have an unstructured grid or something like that, I can write a single file in a very ordered data, even though if my data is unordered in, in, on the actual processors. So that, that's, a, that's a benefit. It's a little more bookkeeping, but it allows you to write that one file as opposed to if I had just to write a series of individual files, I have to just write the data I have in my memory, and then I have to go back and post-process it. This actually allows you to do it in one step. So you can save yourself time there. Um, there's this concept of individual and shared pointers, uh, explicit offsets, you can use a portable data representation, and then you can also uh, give hints. Um, it, it's no text format and output, basically it works natively on binary only. That's, it's designed to be just data memory uh, binary stuff. So the MPI concepts. So this is your process, an instance of your program. This so is say your typical MPI, one per core. You have some communicator, MPI com world. And then you have your size and rank. We've, all, we've talked all about these, so you guys are very familiar from the recent courses. This is just our general MPI concepts are used MPIO. So it's all built around the same idea. You still start MPI init. You still use MPI finalize. All your communicators are the same idea, com world for everybody to communicate. Um, you can make a different communicator if you just want a subset of them to be, say, MPI com output. And then you can make a communicator that only works on those. Then you can just use those guys for outputting. But uh, this is just reiterating what we've already talked about with MPI before. Um, the main pieces kind of work what you'd expect them to be. Instead of having open, you have an MPI file open. So there's a communicator here. Or this has to be set up where you give it a communicator, com world, a file name, and then there's a bunch of different information you can give it, how to open, how to access, read, write, this type of thing. There's a seek, how to look in, the, in that file. There's a set view, which we'll talk about. That sets how you're going to write or access that file. There's a read and a write, and then there's a close. So they're pretty straightforward. They follow typical MPI conventions. Yeah, they're a little clunky. That's one of those cases. You write in the MPIO library, and you can sort it out. And then it, now you can actually do this in parallel. So an open, the simplest one is you just have a file handle. Um, so you, you know, give an MPI file just like you would a typical open. You give it a file handle, and you'll access this. The difference is now. All of your processes are going to use that same file handle, right? So it's not file one, file two, file three. It's just file, right? Then you're going to close it. So we can actually, all, when we do this MPI file open, now we'll all be able to access this test.dat file, right? So it's very synonymous with, with, with on purpose, to be like a typical uh, open and write type process. So I'm not going to get into this here, but this is for more for you guys later. We do have examples of this clone, this parallel I.O. example. Um, you can run this MPIO test case, and uh, we'll walk through the there'll be examples of this up here, too. Um, and it shows it includes what libraries you need. This is, this is just standard open MPI on Signet, but it'll show it's a good test example if you're going to write your own or you want to see some stuff. Um, and that's what I've got right here. So. It's really just a, this is just a standard code. I cut off the stop, the start, the init stuff, and the finalized stuff just to make it smaller. But basically, this is all it really requires to write a chunk of data to a file. So it's a little more uh, specific in this case because I do need to create a specific offset. This is where I said the manual comes into. MPIO doesn't really understand um, uh, types in the sense that it doesn't know intrinsically that a type that a that our double is eight bytes. You have to actually do the math yourself. That's why it's a little lower level. So you have to actually say, my message size is 100. 
times whatever rank, and so I'll offset to write in that specific spot. Because I want to tell if I've got, I'm processor one and I've got 10 doubles, so I'm rank zero, I'm go zero to 10. They're four bytes each, so I'm zero to 40. <laughs> then the next guy over, he's going to write his 10, but he doesn't want to write from zero, he wants to write from 41 to 80. So you have to do all that sort of, you know, putting things in the right spot. So we open a file, we're going to create it, we're going to write only access to this file, so pretty straightforward. We're going to seek to a location here, and then we're going to write. So we're going to give it file handle. A uh, message in this case is just a, a, an array of characters, a size, how long it is, and then we get a stat, and then we close that file. Um, but see, in this case, we actually have to set to an offset, because every processor we don't want them to all, if we don't give that offset, they're all just going to write at the beginning of the file, right? We have to do that, just like when we do our message passing, we have to work out the logic of where do I start, and then just like writing into a, an array of memory or something. In this case, I have one big data file, but I still have to tell it where to go. Yeah. Well, that's going to the location. It's setting a pointer to where this one's actually going to write the data, but on the individual, each individual processor, this is telling it where to go. So if I didn't do this one, they would all just start to write it zero at the beginning of the file. So if I have four processors, I don't all want them to write it zero. Say I want to break it into four chunks. I want one to write the first piece, one to write the next piece, one to write the next piece, one to write the last piece. So this seek, now on the z processor zero, this offset is going to be zero, right? That's what that offset is right here. Message size times the rank. So it's, the rank is my processor. So if I'm processor zero, my offset is zero, right? If I'm processor one, I'm the size of the message. So I'm off the same sort of thing as I move across and across, right? Does that make sense? No, well, I mean, you're just, you're, when you do the FBI open, um, it's just, just, just a pointer setup. You're not actually, not, it's not actually doing anything to edit for space. No. You're actually going to, well, there's a, there's, this is very simple. There's other ones we'll talk about in terms of how they, you can do, you can do a lot more complicated things with set views and stuff. So an easier way to do this is instead of actually seeking and writing yourself is to use one of the, combined ones where you use a write at. So it combines these together. Um, so now you can actually do that in one step. And so then this, is, this can be coordinated, right? So now instead of using the individual seeks, now we're actually going to do it with a write at. And so we're doing the same thing, but this assumes it's an MPI call. So we're all going to do this at the same sort of time. So we're all going to do this together. And so then even more than that, there's also a collective one on top of that, which is a write at all. So this one kind of works that everybody does this together at the same time. Now this can be good or bad. It means now we're chewing up the file system, but we can also guarantee that all my codes at a certain spot have got to that point and they all write their data before I continue on. So the choice of usually, you normally don't do this unless you want to do something funny. Um, it's usually better to use a write at, because now it's one step. I build this in together or a write at all. And the circumstances of which ones are better really depends on um, um, your, uh, your interpretation or what you want. Okay, so that's the main pieces. And I'm not going to, there is a lot more to get into with MPIO. Um, you can, oh, I just want to mention, so here's a, here's a diagram of what we talked about. Um, I probably should have put this up first, where the idea being is processor zero, he's setting into here, he's setting into here, he's setting into here. Now, at the simplest case, these views are all exactly the same. Or just a chunk of you're writing a simple array, but you may actually have something where so this is just showing you open setting an offset. I'm setting a, a file set view in this case. I can actually set this view where it's very simple. But you can imagine a case where I have a more complicated data structure where I'm inter, interleaving various pieces of data. Well, you can actually set these views and then actually write into them in an interleaved manner, right? So this is where it gets a little more complicated, but you may actually just have something more than a big array of doubles. You may have some sort of 
structured set. So then that's what the idea of this file set view allows you to do. So you come up with you come up with your sort of like 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 a struct of data or whatever. Then you you tell it how many bytes there are or how many doubles or how many integers, and then you can write in this different path. Uh, I don't want to get into too much of this stuff. There is a lot more detail that can be got into this type of stuff, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's something you're probably not going to be doing unless you really um, have. So this is the the view is allows you to um, set a view so that you can set a pattern so that each processor can write them in a different way, but you can either map exactly what's in memory to a disk or exact a certain format that you want. Say you were wanted to write, you know, uh, like you could actually write a JPEG or something if you really wanted to, or a PNG file where everybody writes his own structure of that data into that file in a certain pattern. You have to do the bookkeeping yourself, but you could actually do that traditional serial format if you do it right. Um, so the set view is one that allows you to do this, where you can create these E-types, create offsets, and then all this other type of stuff. I don't want to get into too much of the details because it gets bogged down, and it does get kind of have to dig into this a bit. I just want to make it known that within MPIAO, you can do some pretty neat stuff, but it is fairly low level. You're going to have to spend some time <laughs> figuring out your offsets and where things are. But if you have, it's one of those things, though. If you have a specific file format you're trying to write, you do this once, you test it out, and then it gets put in I.O. library, and you don't have to think about it. But this will also come up, too, when we talk about some of the higher-level libraries, where you can see they're leveraging these ideas um, in their own data formats. OK? So that's just a quick, really quick overview, not really enough to do much with it, but of what MPIO is. The simple examples are pretty straightforward, but if you start getting to the E types and sets, it, it requires a certain more. Uh, and we do have some examples on the sign at wiki if you go into the tutorials page. We've, got, we've done some day-long parallel I.O., which have a lot more comprehensive examples um, about, you know, specifically MPIO. Okay. So let's talk about um, more of the higher-level libraries here, our uh, NetCDF and HDF5. So um, they kind of go hand-in-hand because -hand one's built on top of the other, um, at least in, in parallel. Um, these are standardized fo uh, formats for scientific data. HDF5. Uh, there was an HDF4, but most people are using HDF5 now, um, is, a, is, a, is a standard, and it's very extensible. There's lots of uh, modern features in it. If you, design, if you use the API, you can do serial, you can do parallel. Uh, it supports a lot of the newer standards, a lot of a CFD, like CGNS data, or a lot of your um, uh, commercial codes now actually back end with HDF5. You don't know that, but that's actually what they're using. They're using this library. Um, NetCDF originally came from the guys in uh, the weather research, UCAR. Uh, but it's an even simplified version of HDF5, specifically for just saying, I have a bunch of data that's in a series of arrays, like, like we most store them. I just have an array of IJK, and I want to dump it in a simple, nice way. That's what NetCDF allows you to do. And in parallel, it just builds on top of HDF5. Um, and the good thing is there's a lot of really, there's a lot of common community usage for these guys. Um, they're both open source, and they're very well documented, and they're pretty much on every HPC system. So on Sinet, you just load a module, HDF5, which what specific version you want. You don't have to build it yourself. You just link against it. And that's pretty true of any modern HPC system. So if you use one of these ones, um, it's pretty flexible that way. And there's a lot of good tools in this, too. They're self-describing. They have the metadata built inside them. You can query them. How many, how many pieces of data do you have? What's, what, they're all binary format. The one thing I didn't mention about MPIO is it's Endian specific. So if you're on different architectures, um, it will be of that Endian. If you use these ones, you don't have to worry about that. So you can just take the file and copy it from different systems, and it won't matter. So it's it's more portable that way. They've made sure of that. Um, so yeah, and NetCDF is specifically aimed at storing large multidimensional arrays. But it, so, it, so if you're having more complicated data structure, it's probably too restrictive for what you want to do. If you have complicated, you know, unstructured data sets with lots of mixed different types. But if you just literally are storing large amounts of traditional arrays, um, then NetCDF is probably the easiest way to get started. Uh, HDF5 is a little more general, but it requires a little more bookkeeping. We're not going to get into HDF5 today. Um, we do have examples if you're interested in that or something you want to do. You talk to us. We have some good examples in it in the parallel IO course, but it, it kind of takes a little more to get set up. So I'm going to focus on just NetCDF and kind of walk through an example because it is fairly straightforward. 
it's the type of thing that just in a few simple slides, you can, you can see it. With about five calls, you can start using it right away. So, um, so it, it's, MPI say is too, oh, is, too, is too low level, then you can just use the API to access NetCDF. So that's just a series of function calls, effectively, in this case. Um, and it's a higher level approach just for writing these uh, multidimensional arrays. So, so the, the data model is trying to be as simple as possible with, with, um, with NetCDF. So you have, at the very core, you have a chunk of binary data, right? You have some array. That's array, array X, it's, got, it's two dimensional. 10 in one direction and 10 in the other. So, and it's of, uh, what, it, what, what, what do I need to know about that array? I know it's type, so I gotta know if it's an integer or floats or doubles or something like this. And I can give it a name, ABC. Then, in this case, it's two dimensions. So I store that piece of information. Uh, then I give a name for each of those dimensions, X, Y, right? Then I, give, I, have, I can store some extra attributes about that you know, what it is, temperature, or something like that. And then I can take multiple sets of these, put them all together to form a file. And also in that file, I can give information about the file attributes. I can store some one-dimensional information as well about that, and then put this all in a file. And that's basically what builds up a NetCDF file, right? But at the core of it, it's really just a series of arrays. And that's what you're going to store. You may restore multiple ones of it, but you're really just storing a chunks of traditional know, n-dimensional type arrays, which most Fortran and C codes, that's how your fundamental data structure is stored that way. So that's why this works really easy for a lot of scientific work, because the bulk of your data is going to be stuck to stuck away in, in some array. So the API, um, you know, defines the functions. So what's in their input, their output. It gives you some options. NetCDF is really simple. It just uses a series of integers. Um, to store the C types. So you'll see in the examples, it just use a series of integers um, to set those parameters. It can be a bit limiting, but it's limiting on purpose. It's supposed to be simple. Um, and then there are APIs for Fortran and C. There are some for C++ and Ruby. I know we've been using C++ this class, but kind of like the MPI, the C interface is more portable or more flexible. You get better documentation on it. So I stuck to the C interface in these examples too. If you want to look in the C++ specific with classes and structs and stuff, uh, types there is some there is some support for that, but as usual the C C one usually is the most straightforward to use in an API sense. Um, so there's an example here too. So we've got some example in the same when you pull that repository from the previous example. There's also a directory for NetCDF and uh, uh, HDF5. Uh, you'll see this is NetCDF4. There is th actually three different data formats. Unfortunately, with NetCDF, there's an original. 32-bit version, a 64-bit, and then a NetCDF4 version. Um, if you're starting from scratch, you probably want to use the newest one because that NetCDF4 um, is the HDF5, which supports parallel. Um, so that's, if you want to go that way, um, that's what we're using here. Um, just be aware, if you're working with other stuff, there are slight different variances. The original one only had 32-bit offsets, so it couldn't go make files over 2 gigs. So it's better if you use some newer stuff. Just that does come up, <laughs> like a lot of stuff with legacy. So you run this test, it outputs a, a file called test.nc, and because it's self-describing, actually, you can actually do this ncdf dump and ask the file, and it'll tell you, oh, I have an array of data with two dimensions, x and y, in this case, called 48, and I've stored the name of the variable called m, so it actually has some information about itself. That's what I mean by self-describing. So there's nice little tools. So that's one of the, another benefit of using one of these, uh, um, you know, file form. It says you don't have to develop that the tools are already there to do this type of stuff. And there's other little tools too where you actually can actually look at the data. So this one's in a little NC view, and then you actually can just see if you want to visualize that particular data set, something simple like this, you can pull that up right away. You didn't have to write all that. Somebody else has done all the work for you. So it, it's, it's quick and dirty. And so let's look in the actual, this, this actual example and see what we did. So it looks a little overwhelming in the beginning, but let's break it down to see what's actually going on here in a NetCDF file. So this is our C code. We just include this NetCDF header file, pretty straightforward. Um, we're allocating a bunch of data here. So we're just, this is the data we're going to store. It's just an array. In this case, it's a 48, two dimensionals array. And uh, so it's n by n, so 48 squared. We're just going to dump the data in here. Then this part here is actual the stuff. If this was, we're just going to dump it to a file, we would just 
loop through that uh, that array and dump open a file, close it, whatever, and and dump into a single file. Here we're going to use their version of stuff. So we first we instead of saying open, we're going to go nc create, give it a file name. So this is very similar to just creating a file. Um, then we're actually here where this is where we're going to give it the bonus stuff. We're going to say oh. We're using this NCID. This is this integer type. As we said, that's how we, we communicate with uh, uh, um, NetCDF. The, and we're going to say, we're going to give it X. That's the name of our dimension 0. Y is the name of our dimension 1 of size N. So we set these up. Then here is actually where we're doing the, effectively the write. Or uh, um, well, actually, no, after. We're actually defining the variable name here. So we, we give it the two dimensions. Then we're actually going to call it M. We're going to give it some extra information as well here. Then we're going to end that sort of metadata section. So this is all just setting up information about the data I want to put in. So this is just giving you the self-describing stuff. So we're just giving that. So it's a lot of little function calls, but it's pretty straightforward. It's just really setting up the dimensions, setting up the variable name. We set that up. Now we've set up this sort of defined what I'm going to write. Now I can put the data inside. So that's our write call. Then I close it. So the right ends up being quite solved. Most of what this stuff is is just actually giving it all that extra information so that when we do run NCDF dump, you can actually see the information about it, right? But it's pretty straightforward. As you can see, this, this doesn't have to be 2D. This can actually be N. I think up you're actually up to 1,000 dimensions or something like that. So, so if you have sort of array-type data, you can imagine you can imagine have series of these. And in this case, we're putting ins, but you can put doubles, floats, cars. You can build up this, just like that original diagram. And actually store that into this standard file relatively easy. Yeah, you're going to have to sit and cut and paste this and, and work it out, but it's I/O. You're going to do it once, and, and then you've got it working, and then and you've got the flexibility in the future. Sorry. Oh, this is just a, a minimization. This is a macro defined, just a short form. You can just think of this as another function, it's a preprocessor directive thing. It's just, and we're generating the data here. It just, it's just the minimum of. This is just. Data, Don't, it doesn't really matter. It's just a way of short forming that. But that's just, we're generating some data to output that plot. But if you already had data, this is this, all we're really focusing on is the, the, those NC calls there. So to write, that was to write it. You create, so as we said, we create the file, define the dimensions, define the variables, end that section, and then we write that file. So describe it, write it. Pretty straightforward. So it's kind of like if we go back to the MPIAO, you could see where we were setting up a file. Remember I said we had this, if we had a complicated data structure, we could set a file view. Well, by making a series of these calls, that's kind of what's going on under the hood if you're doing this in parallel. It's setting up all those low level you know, uh, offsets and all that type of stuff. So you don't have to do that, it's doing that for you. So now to read it, you basically just do it in reverse. You have to ask the file, open the file, you ask it. What are your dimensions? Uh, you know, what's the variables' names? How how big they are? And then you can read them back in. So let's do that in reverse. So we've already written the file. So now the first thing we do is we open it. Okay, we're going to open this file. And then we're going to say, okay, I'm going to ask you about you. What is your dimension of x? What is your dimension of y? Okay, then I'm going to inquire about that to fill that information in. Now I have that. I can actually generate, I can allocate some memory based on that information. And then I can actually get the name if I want as well. I don't need to, but I can get it there. And then I actually can get, get it here. So this is actually where we're going to read it back in. So it's very synonymous, just in reverse, right? The other case, we're going to write out all the dimensions information, and then we're going to pull it out, write it. This one's going to do it just, you're going to query all the information, and then you pull it out. And now we can actually call, pull that, find the maximum or something like that. So these two examples sort of set up the very, the very, you know, it's a very basic example. We're only running one or one two-dimensional array, but it's just, you're just scaling that out into multiple versions of this, or multiple data sets in the same file, right? So yeah, it's a little more upfront work, but you get a lot more to it. You're actually getting a lot more information in the file itself, so you're self-describing it. Um, but I don't think it's any more write statements than as if you were writing your own metadata inside your own file. As I said, the nice thing is usually with this type of stuff, make a little class or a separate function that does this for you, and then you can interop them, make them interoperable. You pass in the data, and it writes all this stuff. 
then you have it in a separate function. So it, you kind of hide that away. And if you want to play with parallel I.O. or different file formats, it's usually not too much work to switch between them, depending on how complicated your data structures are. Um, NetCDF also allows you to introduce this idea of subregions. So in these cases, we were just dumping out the whole thing. But say you're like, I really only need row, every other row, or a certain subsection. Well, I can actually, instead of defining the, like in this section here, uh, where I just see here, I was going, I'm taking the whole array of 48 by 48, and then I just take the whole thing. When I do the put, I'm just saying so total size of the data. I can actually give it a subsection of that too, which what NetCDF, they, re they refer to as a, um, a subarray. Right? So you can actually give a start count. So when you put variable, you can just give it a start, a count, and a data. So you can stride over data and stripe it in a different way. Maybe you wanted to put it in a different pattern. Or maybe you only want a one slice and you got a time series and you only want you know, the x variable and you don't want y and z or something. You can do that. And this is an important concept too because this is exactly um, uh, how we're going to do it in parallel. There's some details with NetCDF just trying to sell it. You can, you can change the size of the, the, how much you grow and stuff. I'm going to skip that over. It doesn't really matter. But I, what I want to lead in is, is that if you, have this, if you have this idea of a subarray, you're doing this in parallel, right? If, you each, if each processor, say you had four processors, and one guy had this guy data, one guy had this data, one guy had this data, one guy had this data, right? Then there's no reason that I couldn't create that one NetCDF file from multiple processors. So there's slightly different ways to do it, but that's exactly what it's going to do. It just has a slightly different function call to do that. Um, so this actually, NetCDF4, it has to be the NetCDF4. That's what we're talking about anyway here. Um, it's built on top of MPIO. Instead of just F open and write, which is a serial version of it, it's actually going to use the MPIO calls to do all this stuff. The good thing is it's hidden from you. You don't see that. Yes, you needed to compile it, but it, 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 it's hidden from you. So it can be as simple as creating and just just change how you're initially starting, which uh, instead of calling that NC open, you call a slightly different function, the parallel version of that. So you have NC create par instead of just create, and you have NCI open par, right? So you have, and the only thing difference in those ones is you have to pass in some MPI information. If you have an M, if you have an MPI code already, this is pretty straightforward. So the difference, so it's only a few minor variant changes to what you may have already had for your traditional serial um, NetCDF code. So it's very similar, but without having to get into the details of MPIO, which is the big, the big win in this case. So here's an example of, we're going to do this, the, the, our CDF, I'll put the data here. So this is an MPI code. So we have our NPI init, com size rank stuff. We have some checks for the size of the problem. And this, we're just dividing it up by N. So that's the rank times N divided by the size of the problem. Uh, local data instead of global data. So now we just have our data for just our individual processor. Difference is here, now when I go to write it, I'm going to have, say this is four. Instead of four files, I'm still only going to have one file. But I have to write my piece into that file in the right order. So create par. So it's the same as create, but just now we're going to have this par test. We're going to have, we have to pass it the com world, the info, which we've already got from up here. But these stay the same, right? This net save dimension is still dimension 0, 1, because on my local processor, I still only have, I have 48 by 48. My global problem is 96 by 96, right? But if, if I'm in, in 2D, or if, I, if I'm in uh, sort of four processors, um, I only have to work with that individual piece. So this, so this day is the same. I just create this one to make it MPI aware. I'm still working with my local data here. Then I define it in the same sort of way. I can define this variable with my fields and dimensions. That stays the same. Then I, I, uh, I, ha I can define an access field for how I want to access in this case. This one we're just we're saying do the collective operation. Now what that means is is that we remember I I showed you three different MPIO ways to do that. You can do a seek with a write. You can do a write at, or you can write at all. Basically, this one is controlling how which which MPI call it's going to use. 
is you may want to tailor. Do I do it all at the same time? Do I synchronize it? That's up to you. So in this case, we're going to use the collective, which is the right at one, which is traditionally the one you're going to want to use. Um, write it all, I guess, in this one. And then we just put the put at the end. And close, then MPI finalized. So yeah, it's a little more work because it's with MPI, right? But it's it's really in the same vein as the serial code. Without you didn't actually have to do any MPI program. The only thing you kind of had to know about is you had to know which communicator you wanted to use and which where I wanted the local data to be. But I'd actually all the all the details about offsets and seeks and file set views, I didn't have to know anything about. The library is taking care of that for me. And I'm still, if I know in NetCDF and serial. It's very similar. So you could easily you could easily have two versions of this code with a couple if defs and have the parallel and serial version and, and it will work perfectly fine um, without too much extra work. Was there any quick questions on that type of stuff? I know there's a lot of I, I know there's a lot of syntax here, and I'm not trying to get into every step by step syntax because that's more you're going to have to sit down with the code and sort of work that through. And that's what this, come back to the slides or go through those examples, pull that repository, use that as a reference point. Um, there's a pretty good documentation at the Unidatus website for the C interface or, or Fortran as well. Um, it spells it all out. There's good examples, some good diagrams. Said what's well, a good, good, good thing about using a, a very commonly used well-supported uh, API is, is that there's good documentation out there and lots of good examples. Um, so you can probably find what you're trying to do out there. Um, so that's out there. Uh, HDF5, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to get into the details, but just briefly mention it. It's the hierarchical data format. As I said, this is, this is a generalization. I guess you could see it as NetCDFF. This allows you to do a lot more things. Uh, you can do object-oriented description of data sets. So say if you don't have, if your work is always in arrays, then that works fine. But say you have a very complicated, unstructured, you know, data set or you've got uh, very, you don't have a regularized pattern or you have it stored in, in very complicated, so not even very complicated, but just in a different way, HDF5 allows you to get in and describe much more of those low-level details. Um, you can arrange, you can do subgroups, you can do lots of more fancy stuff. It's not as restrictive as NetCDF, but what comes with that is you have to do a little more work. Um, it, it's perfectly valid to use, and if it works with, and, and a lot of people use it because not everybody works with just arrays of data, but uh, so it's a little. It takes a little more work to do, but it may. It's more flexible, it's like anything, right? It's kind of like NetCDF up, up here, simplest, most restrictive. HDF5 is in the middle. MPIO is at the bottom, right? I mean, in terms of the complexity increases as you go down, but the flexibility increases. So it depends on what level you. Usually, you want to work as close to that pyramid as top of as possible. If you can get away with it, stick to the simpler ones. Um, you may have reasons too if you're working with post-processing software that uses one of these formats. That might be another good reason just to stick with one of those formats. Um, so just in conclusion, there's um, there are quite a few options about parallel I/O. We talked about some of the main ideas of I/O. You know, do binary, um, do parallel I/O from some level. Use one of these APIs if you can. Write your own if you can't. Um, they're port. Let's see if I have an HDFI reportable. Um, they're not the only ones out there, but they seem to be pretty dominant in the scientific world. Uh, they can also, apart from performance, they also make your, it'll make you more efficient if you use one of these, just in bookkeeping and using the tools that go along with it. Um, and just pay attention to what, the biggest thing I can say about all this stuff is however you want to, you end up doing this, just pay attention to your IO. Um, usually with, especially when you get to HPC, everything gets, you get an uh, N, N version of everything. You start doing a lot more, and you start generating a lot of these things. And it quickly, the amount of data you generated or work with can easily spending a lot more time just managing that data than actually doing simulations type stuff. Um, that's very, very common batch processing now. So just just be aware, and there are tools to help you that. And if you start early with these, then it'll just make your overall process and dealing with the data more efficient and save you extra. Bookkeeping, if you got a, a lot of people are now going back and processing data that they generated and spent all that time. If you do it up front, you don't have to do worry about it. So, okay. I think that's all I got today. Okay, thanks.